Hey, what's going on, AP government people? We have Chapter 4 of the 15th edition of Government in America for you today. This one focuses on civil liberties and public policies. So let's start off talking about the Bill of Rights and what exactly civil liberties are. Well, civil liberties are protections for individuals against the government. And an example of civil liberties is the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Many Americans, when we're talking about the Bill of Rights, and particularly the First Amendment, love the idea of rights in theory, but they don't always follow through when certain elements are put into practice. An example is that court case we talked about a few chapters ago, Texas versus Johnson, in which it was declared constitutional to be able to burn an American flag. That is a form of speech. Also, a KKK rally. KKK members say some pretty vile things about other individuals. Most people don't believe that KKK speech should be protected. Part of the First Amendment states that Congress shall make no law, and this is known as the Establishment Clause, so be familiar with that. And originally, through the court case Barron v. Baltimore, the Supreme Court interpreted the Bill of Rights to only apply to the federal government. So these were only protections from the federal government. They were not meant to protect individuals from states. It's not until 1925 in the Supreme Court case Gitlow versus New York that through the 14th Amendment, which we'll talk about later, states must respect the First Amendment. And this is known as the incorporation doctrine, that the Supreme Court has applied the Bill of Rights to include protections from state governments as well. And they do this through the 14th Amendment, which provides equal protection under the law. All right, freedom of religion, the free exercise clause states that the government cannot abridge, and that's a fancy word for prohibit or limit, religion or worship. Now, this does not mean that any individual could do something illegal and say, I'm doing this because it's a part of my religion. That is not an excuse to do something illegal. In the Constitution, nowhere is it found is separation of church and state. This idea really came from Thomas Jefferson, who talked about a wall of separation between church and state forbidding the government of favoring a religion. So if the government can't favor a religion, can the government provide aid to religious schools? The answer is yes, according to the Supreme Court case Lemon v. Kurtzman. However, the aid must meet certain criteria. It must not advance or inhibit religion. It must not entangle government with religion. And it must have a secular or worldly purpose or a non-religious purpose. So examples of using money for religious schools, public money for religious schools, includes money for textbooks and lunches. The Equal Access Act of 1984 stated, states that schools cannot prohibit students from using school grounds for religious worship, provided the schools allow other meetings. So if you are at a public school, you are allowed to use those grounds for worship. And the Ten Commandments cannot be posted on walls of public schools. The Supreme Court has said that that is too much of favoring a religion. Angle versus Vitale is a very important court case. This states that school-sponsored prayer in public schools is illegal. So if you are at a public school, the, the school cannot lead a prayer before, say, a football game. That is illegal. It does not say that students can't pray in school. They can. It just means that prayers cannot be led by school officials. In 1968, the Supreme Court ruled that states cannot prohibit the teaching of evolution in public schools. And this guy would have been very happy, John Scopes from the 1920s, the famous Scopes trial. He was a biology teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, that was arrested for violating the teaching of evolution. Now, the schools cannot prohibit the teaching of evolution. Now, the Supreme Court generally has ruled in favor of accommodation of religion and not favoring any one specific religion. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 was established that allowed people to practice certain religious rituals unless the government could show a compelling interest to regulate those rituals. In other words, if things were a little out of the quote-unquote norm, a ritual, that could be performed unless the government could prove that they had a compelling interest to stop that. But this was later declared unconstitutional. All right, let's talk about freedom of expression. Prior restraint means government censorship. And the First Amendment limits the ability of the government to censor material before it comes out. It's very, the government has very limited ability to do that before. 
However, this does not apply to school newspapers. So if you have a newspaper in your school, the school can regulate that. And it also does not require, does not apply to any issue that involves national security. And in a post 9-11 world, many more things have been discussed as being national security issues. A thing to keep in mind. And if you watch my APUS videos, I've talked a lot about this. During times of war or crisis, individual liberties and rights decrease. And this is established in Schenck versus United States in 1919, this famous court case in which the Supreme Court ruled that free speech could be limited if it poses a clear and present danger. And here is the, the author of that clear and present danger doctrine, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Look at the stash on him, huh? Is that not good or what? And he famously wrote that an individual cannot yell fire in a theater, that you cannot go into a movie theater and scream fire and, and think that there's nothing wrong with it and you will not get in trouble, if, in fact, there is not a fire. The Smith Act of 1940 made it illegal to teach or favor the violent overthrow of the government. And Roth versus U.S. in 1957 deals with obscenity. And this stated that obscene material is not always protected by the First Amendment. Miller v. California from 1973 allowed the Supreme Court to define what they believe obscene material is, and they believe it is anything that encourages an excessive interest in sex, if it is patently offensive in terms of sexual conduct, if it lacks literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. And obviously these definitions are, are open to interpretation, and what is obscene has changed over time. Libel and slander are two terms that you hear quite often. Libel is publishing malicious, false statements intending to damage a reputation, and this is something that is written. Slander is spoken, S slander, S spoken, libel is written. The Supreme Court case New York Times v. Sullivan, the Supreme Court ruled that public figures have a higher threshold than private individuals. So if you write something malicious that is false about a public figure, you'll have a harder time proving damage than a, than a private individual. So public figures have a harder time proving liable in court. Slander is making a false statement intending to damage a reputation. Again, the same thing, just it is spoken. The First Amendment does protect symbolic speech, and I talked about Texas versus Johnson to begin this video. That is an example of symbolic speech. Another example is a court case, Tinker versus Des Moines, Iowa. During the Vietnam War, many students were wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War, and the school told them, if you wear a black armband, we will suspend you. And they ended up suspending the students. They took their case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that students have the right to do some, that students are protected under symbolic speech as well. However, commercial speech or advertising is much more regulated. And the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, can regulate what can be advertised on TV. Think about it. You don't see advertisements for cigarettes on TV. You used to be able to, but you no longer can. That's regulated by the FTC. The FCC can regulate what appears on TV and radio as well, and that limits the amount of swear words that can be said on a certain channel. Let's talk about freedom of assembly. What exactly is it? Well, it's the right to gather to make a statement or a point and examples include parades, protests, pickets, etc. Oftentimes, a permit is needed to assemble in public places. So you really can protest and, and picket and have a parade, but you need to plan out in advance and have a permit to get approval for that. Now, when we're talking about rights, it's important to know that rights may often conflict with each other. So, for example, women in this country have a right to an abortion if, if they choose to do that. However, another right is the ability to protest abortion. So these two rights are conflicting with each other. The right to assemble also includes the right to associate with other like-minded individuals. And this is something that the NAACP would dealt with in the court case NAACP versus Alabama. Alabama demanded that the NAACP turn over their membership list. And the NAACP refused to, citing privacy issues, and the Supreme Court agreed. They said that the NAACP membership could not be forced to be turned over to authorities. The Second Amendment deals with the right to bear arms or weapons, and the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In the District versus Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court ruled that the ability to possess firearms, guns, are unconnected to militia service. So it doesn't matter if you're not in the militia or National Guard or military, you can still have 
and possess a firearm provided they're used for lawful purposes. Whether it's hunting, whether it's self-defense, you can own a gun provided it is for lawful purposes. So now we're going to shift over to defendant's rights. So if an individual is arrested, there are certain rights that they have. The Bill of Rights can be very vague. One of the guarantees in the Bill of Rights is that you have the right to a speedy trial, that the government cannot provide cruel and cruel and unusual punishment. Well, what the heck does this exactly mean? Let's start talking about searches and seizures. What is probable cause? And this is reasonable grounds that one is guilty. This idea that chances are this person is guilty of committing this crime. The Fourth Amendment prohibits illegal searches and seizures. In other words, police officers need to have a warrant signed to come into your house. In most cases, there are some cases that they can't, including if they believe that somebody inside is seriously injured or being threatened, they can break in without a warrant. Or if they are pursuing a, a suspect and they run into the house, they can then follow them into the house. Over the years, police have increased warrantless searches through reasonable suspicion, which has a, a lower tolerance than probable cause. The exclusionary rule is a rule that says the prosecution cannot use illegally seized evidence in cases. And this is originally applied only to the federal government. But again, through that incorporation doctrine, through the 14th Amendment, this is applied to states as well. We see this in the court case Mapp versus Ohio. Dolly Mapp, living in Cleveland, Ohio, police came into her house looking for a fugitive. And while they were looking for the fugitive, they took a trunk of pornographic material, which at the time was illegal in Ohio, and she was arrested for it. Well, she appealed to the Supreme Court saying they didn't have a warrant for that pornographic material. And the Supreme Court declared that that evidence was illegally seized since the police did not have a warrant for that. So warrants are pretty specific in what they're looking for. Critics of the exclusionary rule tend to think that this is way too lenient to criminals, that some criminals can get off in a technicality, for instance. And those that support the exclusionary rule are saying, you know what, we are protecting those that are accused of crimes, not those that are convicted of crimes. And many people would argue, and some people would argue that if the case is strong enough, they would be able to convict the suspects anyway. So let's focus on, jump over to the war on terrorism. Since 2001, the Patriot Act has given broad powers to the government. The government could wiretap and obtain doctor, library, and school records without warrants, which were required before. In 2005, the Bush administration ordered the NSA to monitor international phone calls and emails to people in the United States. And as of 2014, this practice is still occurring. The NSA is in the news recently, and the Obama administration is using the NSA to spy on American citizens as well. The Foreign Intelligence Service Act gave the government the ability to eavesdrop on large foreign groups all at once instead of using individual wiretaps. And again, the theme is, during times of war and crisis, individual rights go down. Let's talk about self-incrimination. The Fifth Amendment reads, no person, this is a big one, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, so the military has separate rules, but in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, so if you're found not guilty, you can't be charged with that same crime again, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, so you can't be forced to testify against yourself in court, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property. So the government can't take you can't take your life, can't throw you in jail, or can't take your property without due process of law, without going through a trial first. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And this also prohibits coerced or forced confessions from authorities and protects against entrapment, which is when law officials encourage an individual to commit a crime. And if you've seen any cop show, if you watch Law & Order, if you've seen um, 21 Jump Street, which is a great, hilarious movie, you probably are familiar with the Miranda rights. And it's not you have a right to be a, an attorney, as Channing Tatum said in 21 Jump Street, but you do have several rights that police officers will read to you at the time of arrest. The right to counsel is also a right that you have, the right to an attorney. And the Sixth Amendment states that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial 
and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. And again, we're going back to the incorporation doctrine here, ladies and gentlemen. Until 1932, some individuals were tried for capital crimes in states without an attorney. When we're talking about capital crimes, that is a crime that can follow with the death penalty. So Gideon versus Rain, Wainwright in 1963 established the right to an attorney for any individual accused of a felony in a state court. And this is later applied to any charge where imprisonment could be a result. So if you commit a crime, whether it's a state crime or a federal crime, and you, as a result of breaking that crime, can go to jail, you automatically are guaranteed an attorney if you can't afford one. When we're talking about trials, most cases do not go to trial. 90% end with a guilty plea. This is done through plea bargaining in which you will confess to a less serious crime. When I was 19 years old, I was going 54 miles an hour on a 40 mile an hour street. I got pulled over by a police officer. I was given a speeding ticket. I went to court and they offered me the ability to plead to a lesser charge which would not reflect points on my license. I had to pay a fine for something. I don't remember what it was. Maybe like improper lane change. And I had to pay a $125 fine and then attend a five hour class on driving safety. That was a way for me to plead down to a lesser charge that wouldn't put points on my license. And almost all juries in, in all states have 12 jurors and require unanimous votes to convict. So you have to conv convince 12 people that an individual is pretty darn guilty. Again, jumping back to the war on terrorism, after 9-11, over 1,200 people were deemed a threat to national security and were held without trial and in jail. And the U.S. withheld their names. In the Supreme Court case Hamden versus Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, the President Bush administration procedures at Guantanamo Bay, or Gitmo as it's called, violated the Uniform Code of Military Justice and the G Geneva Conventions. So the Supreme Court ruled that these individuals held at Gitmo were allowed to challenge their holding before a judge or a neutral decision maker. So they had the ability to bring their case before a third party. And again, in times of war and crisis, your rights go down. So let's talk about cruel and unusual punishment, the electric chair. Well, the Eighth Amendment states that excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And this applies to states as well through the incorporation doctrine with the 14th Amendment. Now, the Supreme Court overturned Georgia's death penalty law in the case Furman versus Georgia, and they said it cannot be applied in a freakish and random way. It had to be more consistent. In 1976, in Gregg versus Georgia, the Supreme Court upheld capital punishment going forward but there are some rules the death penalty cannot be applied to men, those that are mentally ill mentally retarded individuals under 18 and those convicted of rape that did not kill the victim during the rape or intend to cause death so there are some people that are exempt from the death penalty so let's talk about the right to privacy is there a right to privacy in the constitution well it's not listed in the bill of rights but the Supreme Court begins to use this idea in Griswold versus Connecticut. They declared that a Connecticut law barring or making illegal the use of contraceptives was unconstitutional. And they stated a right to privacy. And this is later applied, eight years later, to the legalization of abortion in the famous court case Roe versus Wade. So in this court case, the Supreme Court stated that states could not regulate abortions during the first trimester, the first three months of pregnancy. So the states cannot regulate or cannot have any laws outlawing abortion. They can only regulate the abortion during the second three months or from month four to six in order to protect the mother's health. And they could regulate abortion, states could, in months seven through nine. In Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the Supreme Court case, this states that states could use a 24-hour waiting period before an abortion procedure. So if a woman wants an abortion, she would go to the doctor's office and have to wait 24 hours before having the procedure. And also, if, if a female was a minor, they would have to have parental consent to an abortion. The Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act made it a federal crime to intimidate abortion providers or women seeking abortions. So it's a way to protect individuals who choose to have abortions. So let's finish up with understanding civil liberties. The First Amendment means all ideas should be heard in a democracy, even ones that may be unpopular. 
And generally, the individual usually wins out if the government tries to restrict expression or worship. And that has tended to not be true in, with national security issues more recently, but generally throughout history, that's how it works. All right, let's do a quick recap. The incorporation doctrine is applying amendments to state governments through the 14th Amendment. That's a huge part of this course. Make sure you know it. Angle versus Vital said this school prayer, school sanctioned prayer is illegal. Rights or speech can be limited in times of crisis. You saw that in Shank versus the United States. You saw that in the Patriot Act. During times of war, your rights go down. The exclusionary rule makes it illegal for illegally seized evidence to be used, and this is applied to the states through Matt versus Ohio. The Fifth Amendment guarantees you the right to remain silent, and that's applied to the states as well through the Miranda rights. And the Sixth Amendment provides counsel and that is given to the states as well through the court case Gideon versus Wainwright. And when you're talking about Griswold versus, versus Connecticut or Roe versus Wade, that deals with right to privacy. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope I was able to clarify chapter four for you. If you have not already, please take a moment and subscribe to my channel and help me spread the word on this video. If you could share this with people in your class or your teacher, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I thank you guys for watching and have a good day.